I don't know about you folks, but uh, when Kevin Lynch speaks, uh, I listen. He is vice chairman of the BMO Financial Group, and he has an extremely distinguished 33-year career in Canadian government, including clerk of the Privy Council, secretary to the Cabinet, and head of the Public Service of Canada. He has been the Deputy Minister of Finance, Deputy Minister of Industry. He, has, he chairs currently the Board of Governors of the University of Waterloo, and he serves on a number of other relevant boards, including Perimeter Institute, Gairdner Foundation, and the Killam Trust. He's a member of the Queen's Privy Council for Canada, an officer of the Order of Canada, and he has been awarded many honorary doctorates by Canadian universities. Please welcome Kevin Lynch. Thank you very much, Harvey. Thank you all for, um, for the opportunity. It's always, um, I'm going to talk today, <laughs> looking at the agenda, I'm probably not going to correlate hugely with the rest of the agenda, but I want to talk um, about the broader context. And, and, and my bottom line message is, I think the world is changing profoundly. And the status quo is just not an option for us. And that's true whether you're in business, whether you're in government, or whether you're in education. And to talk a little bit about that kind of context today. Now, it's always hard to talk to a um, kind of a, a group that, that you're not totally familiar with. And I just want to give you one, and, and you kind of learn this through uh, experience, but one of my first speaking engagements in front of a group that wasn't totally planned was in the late 90s, uh, Canada was about to open its first major science facility, SNOW, uh, which Harvey would know well in, in Sudbury. And uh, it was really quite an amazing thing. And Professor Hawking was due to come over and, and be part of opening it. Prime Minister Kretschan was going to fly out for it. And it was really one of our uh, kind of big events. And I was there as the bureaucratic kind of supporter for the whole thing, but had absolutely no role other than making sure, like Ainsley, that kind of the PowerPoints were ready and, and other things. Anyways, we got closer to it, and it was going to be fel televised live in the UK and Europe and Canada. Uh, and we had three distinguished Nobel Prize winners there, and again, to talk to the importance of snow, and Professor Hawking was there. I got a little note about an hour or two before we were supposed to go live that the Prime Minister couldn't make it. There was an important vote in the House of Commons kind of that night, but not to worry, uh, Minister Manley would be there to, uh, to do the introduction of Professor Hawking. The one thing that any bureaucrats in the room know is as soon as you hear the phrase not to worry, you should worry. Uh, <laughs> So I thought I should start to look at the speech that was prepared for Prime Minister Gretchen to introduce Stephen Hawking. And it went on for about 30 minutes and said absolutely nothing. Um, but it did it quite elegant. I thought, my gosh, who could possibly have prepared and signed this off? And it, it turned out that it was me that signed it off. But, um, <laughs> which was a lesson to pay more attention, which I've never forgotten. Anyway, so we get close to the event. We're just about to go live. Professor Hawking's up on stage. The Nobel Prize winners are there. And a little note gets passed to me that, unfortunately, Mr. Manley's plane can't land. Uh, so it's you that's introducing um, Professor Hawking. So this kind of sets in, you can imagine, kind of a little bit of uh, angst. And I'm busily sitting on the stage throwing pages of this kind of incredibly meaningless text under my chair. So the first Nobel Prize winner gets up. He talks, he was fantastic, he sits down, the second one even better, the third one, and it's my turn. And I stumble to the podium, and I think in probably 30 seconds, get out at best, kind of welcome and sit down, absolutely mortified. The distinguished gentleman kind of on my left, a Nobel Prize winner who had been magnificent, taps me on the knee and says, well done. And I turned to him and <laughs> blurted out, well done. I said, absolutely nothing. He said, nobody expected you to say anything, but absolutely nobody expected you to be brief. <laughs> Which, and I learned many things from that experience. One was expectations management. And unfortunately, I'm not going to be brief today, but I may be as vacuous. So let me uh, see what I can do. OK, so I've got five messages in this kind of long PowerPoint presentation. The first one, and probably the most important, is the world is changing. And it's actually changing profoundly. And the more you travel around the world, the more you interact with the various kind of sectors, you get a sense. And it's not just we're going through a downturn and things will be back to the status quo pretty soon. These are structural changes. And they're changing our economies, our societies, politics, expectations, the way we do business, the way we learn, the way we do almost everything. And they're changing the drivers of success for everybody, including higher education. So I'm just going to put up a couple and talk to them briefly and then come back 
and hopefully talk a little bit about what they mean in kind of the world of education. I'll do it from the, uh, the top 12 o'clock around. The first is that we've moved, we're moving into, for the first time in a very long time, a two-speed world. And the rich nations are actually in the slow lane. And the emerging countries are in the fast lane. And that's a complete kind of inversion of everything we've experienced since the Second World War. The United States is not going to grow fast for the foreseeable future. China is. Uh, that's neither good or bad. It's just a reality. And we have to adapt to it. So that's the, kind of the first. The message for Canada is we have to diversify. 78% of our trade is with the United States. Kind of the next, kind of almost 20% is with Europe. And the two slowest growing regions in the world are going to be the United States and Europe. And so the United States is going to have to diversify outside of its traditional partners. So are we, and probably even faster because they have more diversified trade than us. So diversification is the order of the day, not because we've done something wrong, but because the world is changing, and it would be foolish if we didn't think about diversifying. And I think that's true in almost every field, whether you're in business, kind of government in terms of trade relations, and education, and where you do. Second one on kind of two o'clock is demographics. And again, you know, this room is the exception, but we're aging, and we're aging quickly in Western societies. This is this year, just to give you a Canadian factoid, but it's similar for the United States, is that the portion of Canadians working is lower this year than it was last year. And we've never experienced that since the Second World War. So in a sense, our population is growing, but it's aging to such an extent that more people are withdrawing from the workforce proportionally than are entering it. And that actually means unless kind of that, that smaller proportion of population becomes more productive, we're actually going to have pressure on our standards of living. And so what's driven us kind of for a very long period of time is not going to drive us in the future. Now, there are things we can do. The two obvious are higher quality kind of talent and actually more talent through immigration. But again, the status quo is not an option. If you go down to the global financial crisis, I mean, it really was the worst financial crisis we've experienced since the Second World War. And, you know, parts of Canada have done um, better than many others, but it's going to have long-term lingering kind of impacts on the world. And it really is quite staggering to see how essentially lousy, lousy mortgages in Arizona and Florida almost brought down the world financial system. It shows you a little bit of how interconnected the world is today. I mean, uh, the, you know, the SNL crisis in the States of two decades before had an impact on the United States and nothing anywhere else. And it, too, was a bad mortgage problem. So, again, it gives you a sense of how connected we are and how it has great benefits, but it has costs. Bottom is the decline of trust. If you look at the Pew surveys in the United States, which are really quite well done, and they're kind of, they ask about underlying drivers. And one of the underlying drivers they ask, and it's not just in the United States, they do them for Canada, they do them for the UK and Europe, is do you trust leaders? Do you trust your political leaders? Do you trust your corporate leaders? Do you trust your regulators? Do you trust your sports leaders? You name it. And that has been trending down every year for the last 15 years. And it's not any one event, it's accumulation events. Uh, but now trust levels are at their lowest that they've been since Pew has been uh, tracking. What that means and why that's important is that when I first started in public service, you started with the presumption of trust. If you announce something, people <laughs> took you at your face value unless it was proved the opposite. Today, increasingly, if you announce something, whether you're in the business world, you can talk to education, certainly in politics and public service, actually there isn't a presumption of trust at the outset. And that makes it much more complicated to do new things. And yet the whole premise of this presentation is we have to do things differently in the future. We've got to break out of the status quo. So as you, and the message here is, it's a reality, so you actually have to design what you do for this lesson trust. It, it's not an absolute barrier to change, but it is a different way you got things. On the right hand, on the left hand side, kind of moving up, information revolution. I mean, we've been talking about it now, and I was involved in kind of early parts uh, in the 90s in, in Canada, but it's continuing at an unbelievable pace. And we've moved from the internet to Facebook to Career Square. Question is, where next? You know, what's it doing to government? Fantastically changing it. Think of this election campaign in the United States. It's not being run on the front pages of the major newspapers as it would have been 10 years back. It's being run in the social media. That's where the campaign is happening. 
That's what will happen in Canada in two or three years in another election as well. So it's changing politics. It's changing how you do business. Think of anybody. If you're under 35, you do your banking online. You don't do it by going to a branch. It's totally changed that. Even think of the horrible events going on in Syria now and how it's influencing. The Syrians, thinking kind of old school on journalism, have banned all foreign journalists from Syria. And the presumption was, I banned foreign journalists, there's no chance of stories getting out about. But today, anybody with a smartphone is a journalist. So you have 60, 70,000 journalists in Syria now informing the world about the horrific events. That's actually a revolution in how you do journalism. I think an interesting question for this conference is, how much of a revolution does it imply for education? and higher education. I think we haven't really got our minds around it yet. And the last is pervasive globalization. It's really quite extraordinary. By the end of this decade, Asia will account for close to 50% of global GDP. A lot of people say, wow, that's an extraordinary event. It's not. It's actually the reemergence of Asia. Asia accounted for 50% of global GDP in the 1700s and prior to this. This is the reemergence of Asia. But it's happening at a pace that nobody can comprehend. In the 50s, Asia accounted for less than 10% of global GDP. And almost 80% was actually in those slow lane Western OECD countries. It's no longer. And the question for all of us is, whether you're in government, business, or I think academe, is are we really ready for that change? You know, have we got our minds around where China will probably have a larger GDP than the United States of America within 10 years. What does that mean for business linkages? What's it mean for new trade and other relationships? What's it mean for education relations? What's it mean for who you train your kids and, and your grads to do? We don't have, I mean, how many Canadian universities today require second language to get a degree? I graduated from Mount Allison in 1972, liberal arts, you couldn't get a degree from Mount Allison in 1972 unless you took two years of a foreign language. It was absolutely required to graduate. And there were a number of Canadian universities at the time that I think there are, abs there are very few, if any, Canadian universities today that require a second language to graduate with a degree. Well, my, my gut feeling is the world is a little bit more global today than it was in 1972. And how can your graduate going into business or anything else be successful today without having some sense of Asian culture, Asian language, South American kind of language and culture. So again, when we think about what it takes to succeed in this world, it's not the same world as the current generation has been educated for. So those are the drivers of change. Hopefully you have a chance to come back to it. So in this profoundly changing world, another issue is it's not all driven by economics as well. And an interesting question is, you know, the the Occupy Wall Street and kind of other kind of movements, the 99 kind of versus one, you know, is it an economic or a social issue? You know, is it a business or a societal issue? Is it an individual or a government one? And my argument is it's all of those, because it goes back a little bit to my trust point, that in Western societies, we're essentially middle-class societies. And as the middle class goes, so goes the strength of our kind of institutions, our giving, our support for things. And you can see on here that if you look at the Gini coefficient, which is the standard measure of the distribution, and the higher up you are is not good, it's actually bad on a Gini measure, um, both the United States and Canada are worse than average. Both have become less good in the last couple of years. Unfortunately, our neighbor to the south uh, is actually moving off center quite uh, quickly. I don't think that's good. And I, don't, I think that's an economic issue as well as a social issue. Because again, if you don't have large scale middle class buy-in to kind of the, the social contract, it's a worry. And it's something that all of us should do. And a little bit, if you think about our great intermediaries, I mean, we really only have three. We have government, where you essentially kind of give the government power, and they have some accountability for your hopes and dreams and fears. That's kind of the social compact. For banks, uh, you give banks your money, and they take care of it, and they lend you. So that's kind of intermediating over time. And education is very much an intermediary. Kind of kids give you their potential, and you turn that potential into talent. Uh, and those are long-term relationships, and you play a huge role in it. Okay, message two goes back a little bit to competitiveness, and competitiveness is changing. Uh, you know, the standard thing we taught in business schools 10 years back was, if you've got the product at the lowest price, you're gonna sell it, that's competitive. That's not our model today. The model is actually bifurcating, and it's bifurcating because of globalization, and it really comes down to two things. You can either have 
creativity, flexibility. In other words, the ability to change your product every six, seven months, keep the prices, you know, if iPad <laughs> kind of, you know, three sells for more than two, sells for more than one. And if you can change that product and the product mix and characteristics and how you deliver it, how you market it faster than it can be mass produced, then actually you're going to do quite well. But if you can't, then it's going to be mass produced by somebody else. And then you get into low cost and huge scale. And frankly, Canada is not going to win in a low cost, uh, huge scale world. And increasingly, it's not certain that the United States can win in a low cost, huge scale. So it's changing very rapidly for us. I think it's even changing in the United States. And what that means is we have to decide which of the two models we're in. And I would argue we've got to be in the creativity and flexibility model. And that really says a focus on innovation and productivity. And how much are we building that into our education and our universities and our research? And I would argue not as much as we should. And I'll talk this about it later. But we don't have as much interaction between business and our uh, education system as we should. And just a couple of quotes to make it. Paul Krugman is a Nobel Prize winner and certainly is not viewed as a right-wing uh, commentator in the United States, has a very interesting quote out recently, which is, quote, the productivity is not everything, but in the long run, it is almost everything. That's worth reflecting on. President Obama, as the State of the Union last year, said, quote, the first step in winning the future is encouraging American innovation. And if you look at either him or his kind of the uh, Emelt um, consultation for the White House, the emphasis on productivity and innovation is really striking. In fact, as a Canadian, I worry that you see more of a conversation about the need to be more productive and innovative in the United States than we do in Canada. An interesting one, Tom, Tom Friedman speaking at Davos last year, and he talks about this almost from the corporate side, that essentially you're getting now kind of the global corporation who doesn't have the same affiliation to geographic or sovereign territory. And the mantra of that sort of corporation, and GE is a pretty good example, is invented here, designed there, manufactured elsewhere, sold everywhere. And that's a different type of corporation. And are we thinking through what attracts that corporation to do things in Canada or the United States, in Ontario? What's it take to attract and hold and succeed in that? It's not the same as when you've got the physical corporation thinking and living in your geographic soil in the way in the past. And the last is Michael Porter, and I'll come back to this, but there's a major study going on. In fact, the study at the Harvard Business School now is asking this question, how does, the Ameri how does the United States be competitive with rising wages long term? I mean, you can become competitive in this world by cutting wages and costs, but we're not going to sustain our standards of living. And so that really is not a long run solution for Canada, for the United States, for Europe. So the question has to be, how do you do two things? How do you be competitive and be able to pay rising wages over the long term? And the answer is simple. There's only one answer to it, it's productivity. And so how do we all, you know, play into that, that's part of the question. So what exactly is productivity and innovation? A couple of knots. Uh, innovation is not the same thing as invention. Uh, and that's really important, actually. And secondly, productivity is not the same thing as working harder. What they are really are transformative. They change kind of the product or the service that we sell. They change the way we produce it. They change the markets we produce it in. And that's kind of the combination of productivity and innovation. And that's really important. And I won't force you to kind of go through this. But there's a neat quote, again, that comes from this year's Davos by a distinguished um, researcher, which is that, quote, research is turning money into knowledge. And innovation is turning knowledge into money. And you have to have both. And the question is, how is the higher education sector engaged in both parts of that equation? I think we're too engaged in just one part of it, the turning kind of money into knowledge. And you've got to have both is the uh, increasing view. OK, message three is, and goes back, if the competitiveness challenge is the ability to successfully sell our goods and services globally, why paying rising wages over time, not falling? Because we can't maintain our kind of middle class if we do that. You can only achieve it through increase and continual increases in productivity. And productivity is, shouldn't be viewed as the P word that we don't want to talk about. It actually should be viewed as the solution that can allow us to increase the pie and make all sorts of public choices that we can't now. The problem for us in Canada, and the graphs will show you three here, is that productivity has been going down over time. The top left shows you productivity growth in Canada over the post-war period. So two 25-year periods and then kind of the most recent tenure. The bad news is the trend is down in growth. 
So we did our best in productivity in Canada in the 50s, 60s, and early 70s, and we did quite well. In fact, grew faster than the United States. We then started to slow, and the last decade has been the worst in Canada since the Second World War. So at the same time, the productivity is becoming more important in that the global economy kind of means that protecting yourself actually works less well, we have a problem. The bottom left-hand side is even more interesting. It's purely the private sector. So leave aside whether we have a bigger government sector in Canada versus the US, whatever your views on government are, doesn't matter. This is private sector to private sector, and it looks at productivity levels. And today, the productivity level in Canadian business is 72% of the United States, 72%. So I don't think most Canadians think that we're less well-educated or we're kind of less capable, but we're actually less productive. And we're profoundly less productive, and that's across every region of the country and every sector of the economy. Indeed, I was one of the authors on, in 1987 on the economic case for free trade for the government with Wendy Dobson, who teaches at U of T now. And one of our chapters on it was, that one of the good economic cases for free trade and greater integration with the United States was that it would uh, push our productivity levels in business to parity with the United States. At that time, we were 93% of US levels and we were worried about it. Uh, 25 years on, we're 72. It's a worry. And then on the right-hand side, uh, just to show you one of the problems, most people correlate productivity with innovation and R&D is a good proxy for it. Canada, if you see at the bottom, has a lock hold on 20th place in terms of private sector spending on research and development. You know, we're surpassed by those powerhouses of Iceland, Ireland, and Slovakia are ahead of us. How in the world are we going to win in an economy that requires creativity, flexibility, new products, new processes, when we're actually near the bottom of the tree. The United States uh, spends twice per capita what we spend, but even the United States is falling behind South Korea, Israel, Singapore, and other countries, and China is picking up. So it's a dynamic, but I'll tell you the starting place for Canada is not good. Okay, so meeting this new global competitiveness challenges, I, I think I mean, you can have a long list, but it doesn't snake you anywhere. I would argue it's really three things. One is it's got to be an absolute focus on talent. In a demogra demographically challenged world, kind of the, the new kind of uh, wealth of nations in many ways is going to be talent. And talent is two things. One is we actually have to have more of it because of the aging, and that requires immigration. And two, you know, the talent that we have domestically, we've got to educate better. Uh, because it actually has to meet kind of the needs of this new kind of global economy and what it takes to succeed in it. The second is innovation. And fundamentally, innovation allows you to sell your product, whether you're kind of in a small kind of enterprise in, uh, in Toronto or you're in a big enterprise kind of selling around the world. It allows you to sell it at a premium product. The minute you're selling a standardized product that's been on the market for a couple of years, you're competing with Vietnam and other places, and that's pretty tough to do. But if you're actually churning out a new good or a service every year, you actually don't have that many competitors, and you can do really well. And the last is globalization. Again, you know, there's not a single emerging country that actually accounts for more than 1% of Canadian trade other than China, and it accounts for three, right? So the, you know, the growth in the world has enormously moved to the Brazils, to Russia, to India, to China, to Indonesia, we sell less than 1% of our exports to those markets. So we're trapped in slow growth, and that's going to influence the demand for the products of the higher education sector unless we diversify. So the three things are really crucial. The question is, how do you help shape those three things? Business can't do it by itself. Government can't do it by itself. Education can't do it by itself. Part of our challenge, and this will be in my kind of concluding slide, is I think we have got fantastic building blocks in Ontario and Canada, but we don't have alignment of those building blocks. I don't think the, you know, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. I wonder sometimes if the whole is even equal to the sum of the parts. And so again, how do you get that sort of alignment that drives a purpose-driven sense of how we have to change and why? So in the new global reality where increasingly talent and innovation drive competitiveness, you know, do we have the right alignment? I'm not going to take you through this kind of horrifically complicated graph that, of course, comes from government, but 
what it does do, and, and the presentation is available if you want, it comes from the innovation panel of Tom Jenkins and others. What it says is that we really have a solitude, solitudes problem in Canada. The left-hand side is our basic strength, and we have real strengths in Canada in our research-intensive institutions. And it can be university, it can be some of the great work that happens in the community colleges and animation and other things. But we've got that capacity. On the right-hand side, we've got a good business sector. What we don't have is the interaction between the two. And I'll tell you, the best problem identifiers are not in universities, they're in business, because business actually deals with customers and markets and comes back. But they're not necessarily the best problem solvers. The best problem solvers have the access to technology, new thinking. And if you put the two together, and Silicon Valley is a great example of where it happens more frequently than most places, you get magic. And that magic is innovation. But if you don't put the two together, you actually get less magic. And that's one of our challenges. So what should Canada do? I'll give you a couple, but the bottom line here is what Canada should do, and the United States does it better, but I think other countries are, are in fact, on the same kind of track as well, is you've got to actually figure out what your competitive advantages are and be leaders in them, right? You can't, there is a huge premium for leadership, not followership in this economy. And it's not just right direction, but it's the right speed in the right direction. Pretty well everybody's going in the right direction. But if you're going at 20 kilometers an hour and your competitors are going at 50, you're not winning the race, even though you're happy about the direction, right? So I would argue, here's a couple. One is, we've got to aim to lead a few technology trends. This is a Canadian one, but I'm not sure it'd be terribly different in the United States. I think the new industrial policy is creative ideas. It's not favoring companies, and it's not even necessarily favoring sectors. It's actually favoring technologies that are going to be transformative and being at the leading edge of those things. And that means taking some choice. Second is, I think we've got to win some Nobel Prizes and other stuff. It, you know, we've put a huge amount of money into research and uh, in our universities in Canada, but we're not winning uh, the prizes that we should. And I think it actually has an, an impact. To win those prizes has an ordinary impact on average Canadians and its validation of their tax dollars going into public education. And I think it's validation for research that are here, that you can be the best in the world from here, and I think it attracts others. I think we've got to become first-class innovators. I think we're good researchers in Canada. I don't think we're as good at innovation as we should be. And it's, it's that kind of second phase of turning knowledge into money. I think we turn uh, money into knowledge not badly. We've got to build a world-class talent pool, and that's two things. And I think we've kind of got a real strength in our capacity to attract the best and the brightest from around the world. I think that is one of Canada's competitive advantages. Uh, but we've got to make sure that we both do that and educate them. And last, I think we've got to rebrand ourselves as being entrepreneurial and innovative. Message four, and I'll go through this kind of briefly. In today's global economy, in a strange way, Canada has done surprisingly well in the global downturn. This is the first global downturn where the decline in the Canadian economy was less than the United States, and it's the first global downturn since the Second World War where the rebound in the Canadian economy has been greater than the United States. In fact, our unemployment rate today is lower in Canada than it is in the United States, and that's the first time since the 1960s that's ever happened. So, in a sense, it proves that we actually can do well, and you can get differential outcomes from differential policies. But if you look on the left-hand side, you'll see, if your eyes are really good, that actually Canada is leading the G7 in growth. The problem is that's the wrong benchmark. It goes back to, so we're the fastest car in the slowest lane. But is that where we really want to be? And I think we should all be changing our benchmark to the faster lane. And there, we're not growing as fast. And so we have a tendency to congratulate ourselves, I think, but it's a bit of a pyrrhic one. On the other hand, if you look at the relative strengths, they are real strengths. Um, there are solid economic fundamentals on the kind of fiscal side. You, you know the mantra. Uh, we've been blessed with natural resources, and I think we've built human resources. Uh, we've got a very sound financial system, and those countries that actually had fa failing financial systems know how bad it can have an impact on the economy. We've got a diversified and resilient economy, and that's, uh, that's an advantage. And the last one, which I think is really important, is that we have strong in, you know, institutions, the rule of law, and civic values. And if you look around the world, increasingly, that's where people like to go, and that's even where money likes to uh, position itself, because it's just a lot easier to kind of live there, grow there, and be prosperous there. So that's the Canadian advantage set. The issue is, 
how do we use it? How do we leverage it? How do we get the maximum for our citizens out of it? And the second to last point is branding. Brands matter, and they matter for the higher education sector as well. I mean, I've been in kind of uh, India, I remember four or five years back, and, and was speaking at the IIT Mumbai, and then had a, a nice session with the senior managers of the senior administrators and the president. And one of the comments was, you know, you Canadians, um, you know, we've had 23 different Canadian universities through separately in the last couple of years. Um, he said, frankly, I know what the 23 universities are trying to do. I have no idea about Canada. In other words, we actually, we're not branding first and foremost Canada. When you go abroad, outside of North America and Europe, first and foremost, your brand is your country and what it stands for. And then if you're in the higher education sector, it's your particular institution. But if you think in India or China, you can brand University X or Community College Y in a hugely complex world, you're crazy without the Canada brand and a higher brand. And let me just give you an example of that. Our potential brand, I just went through it, on the right-hand side is our actual brand. So in all the polling that the Canadian Tourism Commission does or anything else, kind of the Canadian brand is nice. And that is the only brand recognition we have around the world, right? The only thing worse than that is Canadians are happy with that. They're, they're content. <laughs> they think that's okay. We don't have to work any harder or nice. And nice will get you lots of things, but it will not sell your education services, it will not sell your goods and services, and will not give you geo geopolitical power. And the, I think the challenge for us is how do we take the stuff on the left and make it nice plus? Uh, I don't think we have to drop the nice, but we can't be satisfied just with nice. And it's a challenge. And frankly, a lot of countries in the world would give their IT for the left-hand list. We have it but actually we haven't created it into a brand, and that's part of the challenge, and we have to do it collectively. Message five and last is, you know, we're in this profoundly changing world. I, I think we have enormous potential to prosper as Canadians, but we're only gonna do it if we're clear about our strengths, clear about our weaknesses, and also clear about our national interest. There is a, you know, dealing in a global world, there is a collectivity. Uh, you don't do business in China or in India or in Brazil the same way you do it here. You kind of go first and foremost as Canadians with a brand and with an approach. And as I said before, you know, lots of countries are going in the direction. So four points on this kind of changing world. First, mindset matters. I'm really struck by we have to disrupt the status quo. And yet so much of what we do in management is actually to protect the status quo. So we simultaneously talk about the world's changing, but all our performance agreements, whether you're in education, anything else, are to protect the status quo. And I like the quote by George Bernard Shaw, who was worried about the status quo uh, almost a century ago, that says, quote, you see things and you say why, i.e. a protector of the status quo, but I dream things that never were and I say why not. And I think in whether it's higher education, business, or policy, we've got to dream. We've got to ask the why not, not the why. We're focused too much on the why. Second is strategy matters. Um, you know, and world-class excellence, which is what we have to be, you can't be kind of world-class average. It doesn't get you ahead. Uh, you've got to be above average. There was a premier of my home province of Nova Scotia who once said that his objective uh, for Nova Scotians is to have every Nova Scotian above the Nova Scotia average. Um, but Canada actually does have to be above the global average, and it requires making choices. You know, we can't afford to be every A class in everything. Uh, we're a rich country, but even in a rich country, we're going to have to make relative choices. And it really is a question of kind of heterogeneity, not homogeneity. We can't have the best in physics if we do it 20 times across the country. I'm involved in the Primner Institute, and it is amazing what you can achieve if you concentrate resources and actually try and attract the best in the, in the world, but only if you concentrate. Third is innovation matters. And research, as I said, is turning money into knowledge and innovation is turning knowledge back into money. And we need both. And I really worry in Canada, if you look at the data, that in, in a sense, business and academe on the research side, they're strangers and they should be partners. We had a, a conference on innovation a year or two back and one of the American keynote speakers made a really good point. He, he, he has done a lot of work with Canadian researchers and business, is that Canadians are actually good at cooperating, but they're not great at collaborating. 
And I think it was very insightful. We, we cooperate really easily, but collaboration is a higher order. It imposes accountabilities and responsibilities on the part, and we shy away from that. And we kind of confuse one with the other, and I think we've got to think a lot more about kind of that. And the last one is the time frame matters. Dominic Barton, who is the global managing partner of McKinsey, but a, a proud Canadian, has written in the uh, Harvard Business Review about the tyranny of short-termism. In fact, he posits the interesting question to American business that if, it, you know, if business 25 years back was as driven by the quarter as it is today, would you have built the global businesses that you have in the United States today? He argues no. And if there's any sector that has to think longer term, it's got to be the education sector. And so I worry that in many ways, winners kind of ride trends. They don't uh, ride events and we're too much event driven in all sectors and I think we've got to lengthen our time horizon because you know we're we're here for the long term your investments are for a lifetime in each of the kids that you kind of educate our research can transform and that's a longer term view thank you very much